What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another live recording of the Engadget podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar. I'm joined with our reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe, this morning. Hey, Sherlyn. Hello. And our producer, Ben Elman. Hey, Ben. Hi. Hey, so if you have not seen us here before, uh, you're going to see us basically produce the podcast, but in between some segments, we will do live Q&As and we will chat with you guys as much as we can. We can't really do that as we're recording because this is still mainly an audio podcast, so just keep that in mind. But thank you all for joining us in the chat room and you know, spending Thursday morning with us. Shout out to... Who's here? Who's here? A bunch of folks. Mark Bell, right? Bruno, Mark Bell, yeah. Ten, Tendo. I can't say your full name. I don't really know how to say it. <laughs> Our regulars. Uh, some new people too. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. And leave your questions in the chat. Uh, ben, our producer is watching. I'm watching. We'll, we'll try to get to them uh, during the show or during the segment breaks. You yes, can also so tweet us. Really uh, closely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Tweet us at, at Engadget with the hashtag podcast live if you don't want to fight in the YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. The, the priority line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see here. So yeah, it's going to be, we've got a, some big stuff this week. Are you guys good to go? <clears throat> yep, I am good. Uh, my double checking my recording still going. Mm -hmm. Oh yep. yeah, one question before yes. we start. So am mm -hmm. I actually going to be uh, recording my normal man questions or are you just going to- Yes, please those? do. Okay, sure. Because yeah, I like that dialogue. Okay, so. And if you see any good questions from within the chat that you want to mention oh, like within the episode, just, you know. Oh, there's a lot. They're All right. kind of fired up in there. <laughs> we are, this this episode is mainly focused on the review of the MacBook Air M1, but hey, everything is fair game. Well, yeah. Uh, Lewis Simon says, hi from Brussels. Hello, back from New York. And I guess Devendra is not in New York. I'm New York. Do you even know where I am, Sherlyn? <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. So outside of Atlanta, not even in Atlanta. <laughs> Somewhere. Dylan has no clue. Anyway. I know, like, I, I have your address, okay? Let's yeah. get after it. Like, where am I? Right. What's up? Okay, let me just pull up these benchmarks here. Where Good to go. It's Devendra Hardawar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right, we'll kick off the show in three, two, one. What's up, Internet, and welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar. I'm reviews editor Sherlyn Lowe. And today, it's going to be all about the MacBook Air, the M1 edition that was just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we reviewed this week. Uh, was it actually last week? Time just doesn't I mean think it was, yeah, I think anything it was anymore. It was last week. It was last week. But hey, time doesn't mean anything anymore. A week feels like a month, and a month feels like a year at this mm -hmm. point. So check mm -hmm. So we'll be diving into that and some of the latest news, including Twitter fleets and, uh, hey, Amazon getting into pharmacy stuff. That's weird. Uh, as always, if you're enjoying the show, please be sure to subscribe to the Engadget podcast on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes. That one's especially important because um, that's just super helpful in general. And uh, you can email us at podcast at Engadget.com. We typically record live around 10 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, so you can join us at our YouTube channel. Uh, for live Q&A, and maybe you can even be a part of the episode if you mention something really cool. So check that out. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about the MacBook Air M1. There's I don't even know what the official name of this is because in our review, I just called it the MacBook Air M1, but it's the yeah. M1-equipped MacBook Air that Apple just released. Uh, I loved it. It is one of the highest scores I've ever given an Apple laptop, mainly because this thing feels so freaking fast. So just for full context, go check out my review, go check out my video produced by uh, Brian O. Um, like that really just gets to all of it. But my main takeaway is, God damn, this thing is so <laughs> freaking fast and it's so fast it doesn't even have a fan. It is a fanless design that in our benchmarks clocked higher than Intel and AMD's chips on any ultra portable. And honestly, it even clocked higher than those chips on beefier gaming PCs in some mm. respects. So this is our first look at the Apple M1 you know, Silicon. And I think it's incredibly impressive and I cannot wait to see it running on the MacBook Pro and the Mac, and the Mac Mini and maybe you know other systems down the line. It's insane what Apple has managed to do here, but... Uh, yeah, th that's my main takeaway. This is a crazy yeah. cool computer. <laughs> but Sherlyn, what are your thoughts on the Mac Mini? Are you excited by this thing? 
The MacBook Air. Um, yeah, the MacBook Air. For me, I, you know, I haven't touched it, I haven't used it, but I have heard a lot about it. Um, the reviews went up on Tuesday and Twitter was, you know, because I'm in tech Twitter. <laughs> and it was just everyone was super hype about it, which is quite impressive. Now, I trust you, Devendra, of course. Mm -hmm. So if you say it's good, I believe it's good. But when everyone in the industry agrees... I think that is kind then of... Then you're like, oh, I don't know. No, no, no. Be and I'm like, <laughs> I was trying to be nice. I want to be like, if the video yeah. says it, I'm not sure. But if everyone yeah, in the industry exactly. says... That's not, again, I... not nice. But okay, I get it. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> unanimous approval of this thing. And I think like when Apple was talking about the M1 chip and these systems, I think we were all a little skeptical. justifiably skeptical because they were saying things like, this is the fastest core uh, PC ever made. And I think they actually adjusted some of those stats it is the fastest, like low power core. So like the fastest arm core, it's but not the fastest, power. like desktop high performance uh, core. Cause okay. AMD does beat them in some respects, but for what this chip is for something that is in <laughs> a 2.8 pound laptop that is super thin, the design has not changed from the last MacBook Air we reviewed, uh, like earlier this year. So it has the same, like it has a good keyboard. It has the, you know, revamped keyboard, not the butterfly. Um, great sleek design. The unibody stuff hasn't changed very much, but it's what's in it that counts. And man, this thing flies. Like the, when I pulled it out of the box and I just like opened it up a little, it was just boom, ready to go, ready to go through setup. There is practically no wait for it to wake up from sleep. So that was always great, but also it just feels fast. Like the interface almost feels like they took what makes iOS feel so fast and brought it over to Mac. And that's essentially what it is, right? Because it is an ARM-based chip. Uh, mm -hmm. Mac OS Big Sur is optimized for this new hardware. And it just feels like all of a sudden, the Mac hardware and software sides are just running in concert, which to me has always been the best part of iOS. You know, I feel like I, I like a lot about Android phones, but the thing a lot of Android phones do is like they try to throw in special features or extra hardware or extra cameras to kind of mimic some of the like harmonious experience Apple can deliver because they're building their own hardware and software, right? Apple can take advantage of more stuff, whereas Android phones will have to, you know, put in a lot more hardware to deliver a similarly smooth experience in some respects. So they're they're basically recreating that on Macs. And I think that's really exciting. I'm sure Mac fans are happy about this too, because it makes um it makes Mac Apple systems more than just PCs running mm -hmm. Mac OS, right? Like when Apple switched over to Intel chips in 2005, that was a monumental shift. That basically meant under the hood, everything in a Mac was pretty much the same as what was in the Windows PC. And there was like a, a bit less of a luster to the Mac experience. Now Apple can be like, hey, you have an ultra portable that starts at 999, is faster than pretty much most other, you know, laptops out there, uh, any Windows PCs. That mm -hmm. seems like a hard thing to to ignore. Like anybody looking at a new computer now can be like, oh, I want the Mac hardware because it has great battery life because it's yeah. so powerful. This thing lasted uh, 16 and a half hours in our benchmark. And during regular usage, it the battery like would barely tick down. I was able to like use it all day. Maybe by 8 p.m. it would be down to like 30%. But it's just like hardcore because this is a mobile processor. So Hey, a lot of what Apple was saying turns out is true. And <laughs> it is crazy what this thing is able to do. It's just, it's very fast. It's the fastest web browser performance I've ever seen on a notebook or even a desktop, to be honest. Like Safari just loads Safari, up. Though, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah, that's the main thing, right? And so there are native apps now that are built for the M1 chip and everything else runs through Rosetta 2 emulation. But I was surprised, even that felt good. Like I I didn't notice any significant slowdown and even though they're not fully optimized, they still felt like they were running on a fast PC. So Apple did something here that Microsoft really didn't. Could you talk to us about you know what Microsoft did when they tried to bring Windows to ARM? Well, I guess that's the thing yeah. is my question to you, which and, and a question that a lot of people have too, is mm -hmm. why is the, or, or how is the emulation better? Because Microsoft's emulation introduces some quirks, I think, to the system. Yeah. Um, and haven't I haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison, so I can't really tell the difference. Like when you yeah. say, you know, apps run natively uh, on the emulator, 
fast. I don't know. I, well, I not, like not natively on the, the, but apps just run on the emulator because there's a different right. Right. The, native the apps, apps that, and emulated. Yes. Apps. Yeah. The apps that you're talking about that can't mm -hmm. run on the, or the, that yeah. run on the emulator. I want to see how that same app runs on a windows on ARM machine so sure, that I can sure. do kind of that comparison to know well, here, here's, how, how the emulator behaves. Here's the main thing. Some of those apps just don't even run on the Windows on ARM machine, right? You reviewed the Surface Pro X and- Right, that's because yeah. the support isn't very clear. Now, one thing I saw yeah. actually a screenshot on Twitter is when the uh, you go to a download page for an app installer, mm -hmm. um, the, the pop-up actually asks if you want to download the uh, ARM-based version or mm -hmm. the Intel-based version, which oh, I think I is even interesting. Yeah. I saw a screenshot. I, I'm not entirely 100% sure if this is happening on the M1 MacBook Air. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, that's all I've been asking Microsoft to do. <laughs> that is literally what I want out of Microsoft because yeah. you just have to make it clear to people what apps can and can't be installed, but they haven't even done that. And that's been my biggest problem yeah. with Windows on ARM. I hear, um, that. I hear that. You know, the, the emulator is fine. It's workable. It certainly doesn't sound as, as if it's as smooth as Apple's. But app compatibility will always be an issue when you're talking about getting people to port legacy apps over to a new. It, it is, but here's the thing: like when it comes to compatibility, there are apps like 64-bit apps in particular that literally do not run. You cannot even launch them. You can't do on, anything on Microsoft. Yes. On Windows, on ARM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Mac, what Apple has done is Rosetta 2 just handles everything just fine. 32-bit yeah. apps, 64-bit apps. It is seamless to me as a user, which I think is the main thing here. Like if I downloaded an app from the Mac store. Right. Uh, it doesn't tell you up front if it's Mac or Intel, but it is, it'll give you the best available app. If you do a, you know, command I for get info, you can see on the binary if it's a native app or an Intel app. But to normal user, it actually doesn't matter because everything still runs great. So and that's I think important. That's, yeah. yeah, that's important. That's the main thing. Um, maybe Mac users not, aren't as used to just going around the web and downloading random installers, which you can right. still do. And I did that for a bunch of things. It was right. fine. Um, whereas Windows users, they're more used to going to download.com or finding an exe or oh, something. Yeah. And it is a difference too. Like the Windows Store, I think, does a better job of telling you which apps actually run on Windows on ARM hardware. But even then, there's not much there. So right. The thing is, yeah. technically, we were talking about this in a previous episode, which is mm -hmm. all the stuff from the Windows Store should run on Windows on ARM. It yes. will. Yeah. Um, but because, like you said, there's just a dearth of apps. There's not that many apps on the Windows Store, um, and so it's it's you, like Windows users. <laughs> it feels a little shortchanged here. Um, yeah, like I, I would never recommend anybody buy the Surface Pro X. Like as cool as that hardware looks, as sleek as it looks, it is the <laughs> most modern Surface laptop we've or Surface tablet we've ever seen. But why would you buy a $1,000 computer that can't run more like a lot of Windows apps? Like you just cannot work on it the way you would a normal Windows PC. Anybody can go buy this MacBook Air or any M1 computer and just start working. And I think that's the main thing, right? Your workflow doesn't have to change. I didn't have to do anything different because I was using this computer. I was being more aware because I knew what I was testing here. But if I was just a consumer who bought this thing, I'd be like, wow, Apple's laptops are just much better than everybody else's. And that's all that really matters, you know? It's uh to me, mm -hmm. I just there there are still some head to head comparisons I want to make. Like sure. you say it wakes up instantly. I want to see how that compares because instant wake is also a feature of uh Snapdragon PCs. Mm. Um and yeah. battery life would be good to just kind of compare head to head too. But again, those are we're going down to the nitty-gritty, I feel like. I mm -hmm. think if you look at how overwhelming the positive response has been across the industries, uh across the industry, yeah. um, it's clear that Apple has done a really great job mm -hmm. and surprisingly so. I think a lot of us are very skeptical to start with. Hey, I mean, and you brought up Snapdragon PCs. Hey, we've seen a lot of companies try to bring ARM-based chip and mobile-based chips yeah. to PCs. And hey, you've written a lot about that from Computex <laughs> over the past couple of years. I never um, reviewed you know, a few of them. <laughs> yeah, the dream is that you'll have ultra light Windows PCs that'll last all day, that'll have mobile yeah. connectivity and everything. And we just have not seen that happen. I feel like the one thing that's missing from this MacBook Air is like, hey, give us some connectivity. connectivity. Like, give yeah. us now that you have less hardware actually inside the machine because everything is inside the M1 system on a chip. So the ma the RAM, the actual CPU, a lot of the graphics, like all the graphics hardware, there is room to do more and add more components. I feel like Apple um, maybe sitting on the full redesign mm -hmm. of the MacBook Air because this is 
just the same case. We've already seen yeah. just the same keyboard. But the screen bezels are still a little too thick compared to Windows laptops. Like certain oh, things yeah. look a little dated, but the screen also looks great. So it's like, I, I can't complain too much. Um, and the other thing I'll mention here, the M1 chip, because it's ARM based, it is essentially the same chip that is in iPhones and iPads. So you can run iOS apps on this Mac. And that is kind of interesting too. I mainly used it for some benchmarks just to get like a sense of numbers. Um, you could run some iPhone apps uh, basically side by side with your desktop, uh, nice. but uh, developers can also basically keep their apps out of this whole ecosystem. So Google and Facebook have immediately been like, no, you cannot run our apps on macOS. No, thank <laughs> you. So you can't have Instagram open alongside your email, basically, or at least not in a separate window. So that's kind of a shame. And I feel like that really hurts the usability of having these apps there. But it's still kind of cool. I think there's some iPad apps that would fit right alongside a desktop because they'll they're built for bigger yeah. screens. And you know, maybe developers will start taking advantage of this too. I, I will say mm -hmm. again, having not spent any like time with a unit, um, just judging on pictures, there's one small complaint that I have mm -hmm. too, which is like previous MacBook Airs and smaller MacBooks, this thing has two USB-C ports on yep. one side. Yep. And that's slightly annoying to me because I mean, I'm using, I've used a Galaxy Book uh, Flex 13 for a while now. And the best thing about it is that it's got, I mean, first of all, it's got three USB-C ports, but the best thing is more that it has ports on both sides because yeah. I'm not all like I'm <laughs> reviewing another laptop now where the power charging side is the wrong side for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm just mm -hmm. like, oh, now to like rearrange my own. It's, it's a stupid, to, simple to thing, it. right? Like I think it the last is. time I saw that was the HP Spectre X360 that I reviewed like last year and right. that only had things on the right side. That right. is a pain. Apple has done and this for a while with the air, but yeah. If you use a dongle, if you use a USB-C thing, which you have to because like mm -hmm it's just two ports, you might end up covering one of them if your dongle isn't built the right way. Like if it's <laughs> it's a little too wide, it's gonna cover sure. the port. So you, you need a extension cord Pass for your me. dongle. You need to like bring your dongles out a little. It's all a mess. And I do think having only two ports on a machine that's this, typically you'd be like, oh, you have an air, you can only do so much with it. You know, don't stress right. it too much. It's not super powerful. This machine just with the M1 chip, can play some games. Like I was playing Apple Arcade games like The Pathless. I even ran Fortnite in 1440 by 900. So not like mm. super high resolution, but it ran at 60 FPS. Uh, it crashed pretty quickly because Epic stopped updating <laughs> Fortnite. But you can imagine a game like that running on hardware like this with no dedicated GPU. It's just the graphics that are, that are there on the M1 SoC. That is still pretty powerful. The graphics wise in our benchmarks, it just blew away Intel's mm. Iris Plus graphics. The last, the their integrated graphics from last year that Intel was really hyping up. Uh, I have not seen it compared directly to Intel's XE graphics. So that's like mm -hmm. the new thing from Tiger Lake chips. Uh, but basically Apple has accomplished something pretty great here, both in terms of performance and so many other things. I would like more than two ports because if you're charging the computer, that's one taken up right away. Yep. And then that leaves you with just one more. So. You know, that's where the MacBook Pro 13 inch may be more usable, but then you still have only USB C ports, but you get four of them, right? So that's something. I prefer that. Uh, yeah. Speaking of the MacBook Pro, so the MacBook Air you reviewed with the M1 uh, yeah. is the one with no the fan. seven cores in the GPU, right? No. So there oh. are two, just to be aware as you're review or mm -hmm. as you're trying to buy this, the 999 MacBook Air has seven GPU cores, the 1249 model has eight. I don't think there's going to be a huge difference in performance there. You know, it's just yeah. a single core. But if you actually want to use this thing for more like maybe heavy duty work, um, although at that point you're probably going to be a pro anyway, the yeah. 1249 model may make more sense. You can also spend an extra 200 bucks to add 16 gigabytes of RAM to either of these machines. So that's I think that's a good upgrade, especially if you want to keep something for four years or so. So that's the main difference there. I reviewed the 1249 model. Okay, so my yeah. question to you is, over and over on this show, we've recommended people stay away from first-gen products. Sure. What do you think this time around? Is it safe for people to go out and buy these things? I would say, so, and this is a thing I was really also recommending before we fully saw these products. This mm -hmm. doesn't really feel like a first-gen product because Apple has spent the past 10 years, you know, and more than 10 years, building its own chips for all of its mobile devices, for the iPhone, for the iPad, and we've seen every year that those things get faster and faster and faster. Um, I think there was, 
it was a chart from I think a Nantech that was charting like the specific GPU benchmark over yeah, the past few that. years. And Apple is just like going up and up and up every year, like in a straight line. Whereas AMD and Intel, you're seeing some slight curves in how fast their chips are getting, but there's like a certain slowdown. But this year is sort of like an intersection point where Apple basically was forced to move over to their own hardware because their chips are getting more powerful than the stuff they've been getting from Intel. So if Apple had stuck with Intel, they would be limiting themselves and their own hardware. And it doesn't make sense, right? Because they're already building or they're already designing these chips for mobile. So it doesn't feel like a first-gen product. It feels like Apple has actually had years to hone this design. And I, I figure they've also spent a lot of time seeing how ARM chips would work in Mac OS and designing it. I feel like Whereas Microsoft just like <laughs> sent out the Surface Pro X and we've seen some computers just rush out to be like, hey, Windows on ARM can exist, <laughs> except we haven't tested it. There's no app compatibility. Like it doesn't run very well, but it's here. I think I almost feel like Apple had spent at least a couple of years really honing in like how it's working on macOS because it doesn't feel first gen. So I think you're safe to buy this. Um, this isn't something like the very first iPad or the very first Apple Watch where they're just kind of experimenting with this hardware and it's probably going to be abandoned in a couple of years. This feels solid and it feels workable for, for us and for mainstream consumers too. Yeah. I think we had some like normal person questions from sure. Ben, didn't we? Yes. Here is Here are my normal person <laughs> questions. Just from like a consumer who could use... Uh, you know, a little bit of background information. Sure. Um, you know, I, I do eventually want to talk about um, benchmarks because I think benchmarks are really important. That's a little bit past the normal person questions. Yes. Here are my normal person questions. Does this MacBook Air have a headphone jack? Yes. Do, yes. The M1, does the M1 line currently have a headphone jack? Yeah. I mean, that's yes. not anything to do with the M1. This Air has, an, has a headphone jack. Honestly, I was surprised. It was actually Windows PCs are the first I'm seeing that don't have the headphone jack. So I'm looking at you, Asus ZenBook Flip S that I reviewed <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Literally no reason for them not to have a headphone yeah. jack on that. But hey, there you go. So yeah, I'm, I know that you're saying that this is the exact same body design, but it seems like a little um, iterative update like this might be a good excuse for them to be like, oops, no headphone jack. But it, then again, they do yeah. have to retool the body for um, those sorts of things. Though. They do. They do. So yeah, any change takes time and energy, honestly. I could see them if they removed the headphone jack, but added two more USB-C ports on the other side and you had a dongle for headphones, like, okay, maybe that's more workable. I, then at that point, I could stomach losing the headphone jack. Yeah. Speaking of which, that's mm -hmm. that was my next question. Usually Apple blames the lack of ports on the, la on the fact that they need to pack in more hardware. I think mm -hmm. this is something that kind of came over from... Um, from their mobile stuff, uh, especially like why they abandoned the headphone jack. Cause it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, well, you can't get a bigger battery. You can't get like all of this tech that we're packing. And that is much more body. limited space than a notebook. But yeah, that was their main argument for taking headphone jacks away from iPhones. So the system on a chip dynamic should leave some more room for ports, <laughs> right? Like what could their next excuse be then? I mean, I feel like, yeah, it's just, having time to redesign the case and everything. Because from what we've seen, I haven't torn this thing open, but logically the system on a chip just seems more compact. It is bringing together more of the hardware. So the actual motherboard, the actual PCB shouldn't be as big as before. So that should give them more room for things like more ports and other things. I do feel like they wanted to get this out quickly. That's the main thing. Like, hey, we just plop this chip in here. We have all these cases. We know how to build this. We're not messing with anything here. Um, let's just get it out to consumers. Because what's more important than the case redesign is making sure the chip works, it's not crashing, and the software is good. And I think the overall user experience is good. You know, a case redesign would just be like the, the icing on top, you know? So then that gets to the question of like, why, why not put a bigger battery in also? Mm -hmm. Um, like they could yeah. really um, call out the entire industry by saying like, "Oh, we've got a thirty-five hour." Machine I, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think they've gotten that much room out of the out of the chip redesign. That would be um, like double the battery size, and I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> that would but, be a lot of space. Um, 
but to the point about ports too, it's like like when we're talking about case redesign, we mean like these cases, like literal new holes need to be cut. Yeah, in the new cases. holes. They need to be manufactured in new ways. And, like that's a lot of testing that goes right. into that. Right, yeah. and the components need to be arranged closer to the edge, or if you're putting them mm -hmm. like maybe in the middle where there's more space freed up, then like the what, what wiring the connections have to be made too. So there's more than just like oh we yeah. got more space, like squeeze some ports in there. It's there's a, a lot bit more, more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like that's a whole electrical engineering problem and design problem and everything. To what you were saying, Ben, hey, I think they're already making everybody look bad battery wise because my <laughs> actual my experience using this thing is that the battery would basically barely go down. Whereas on my MacBook Pro right now that I'm using for work, so it's like a 2017 era with I think an eighth gen Intel chip, using that thing for maybe three hours will kill the battery. Like the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro, I know that. at least I know that. the last, yeah, the last couple Intel chips. Uh, Intel systems just have not been good with battery. And we've seen PC laptops go to beyond 12 hours with battery life, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I was gonna say, I think that the comparison you were making has partly to do with deterioration over time, just in general. Yep. Nope, no, no, it's shipped like that, that. It's shipped, it's shipped like with that. just three. Oh, 2017, okay, 2017. I remember that being an issue way back when. Okay, anyway, but, yep. but recent mm -hmm. PCs, uh, and you know, on our benchmarks have lasted, yes, beyond yes. 12 hours, some 14 hours too. Uh, Snapdragon PCs are supposed to last 20 to 22 hours mm -hmm. uh, of video rundown, but real world use, they're coming closer actually to more like 10 hours sometimes, depending on how you use. I wanna stress that the Snapdragon yeah. PCs that I've tested are all like, they have LTE connectivity built in. So sure, that, sure. you know, hits your, your battery runtime a little bit more mm -hmm. than the existing model of the M1 MacBook Air, so. That's that's some yeah. context around it, but I will sure. say we are moving towards like longer battery life in general. Apple does seem to be giving everyone sort of a run for their money. Like mm -hmm. PC people, I think PC makers are nervous. They're like, what are we gonna do? Most definitely, most definitely. I'm sure like I'm looking at Intel, I'm looking at AMD and you know, they've all just made recent announcements, but I'm sure Intel in particular is just like, man, this is a punch Intel's to the like, oh. because yeah. <laughs> Apple just comes out with a chip that is significantly faster than anything Intel has really been working on. Intel is still within the M1 chip. Like these, uh, the ports are Thunderbolt 4 ports. So Intel isn't fully out of the Mac ecosystem, but it is kind of embarrassing. Like Apple just showed everybody up and I'm not a fanboy here. I review Windows PCs most of the time. I scored this thing. I love the XPS 13. <laughs> I love the XPS 13. I scored the XPS 13 the same as the MacBook Air M1 because Ooh. I think that is the sort of also ideal polished Windows PC experience because it has practically no screen bezels and super fast and everything. I just, I'm just really impressed with what Apple has done here. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what people say, like once they actually get to use this for themselves. Speaking of Intel and AMD, show mm -hmm. us them benchmarks. I, a normal <laughs> man, will just smile and nod like I know what's going on. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, okay, let's go look. If you go look at my review for the MacBook Air M1, the, main, <laughs> the only like cross-platform <laughs> benchmark I could really find was Geekbench 5. So even in that, right, the MacBook Air uh, scored 1,619 points in single core, which is faster than the Dell XPS 20, uh, Dell XPS 17, which is running a beefier H series Intel chip. It's faster than the Zephyrus G14, which is running the like highest end Ryzen 9 AMD CPU. That's Those things uh, scored at around. Than yeah. Sorry, I just tested something that's a 10th gen Core i7, and it's yeah. single core is 911. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the fastest Intel and AMD mobile chips can get you around 1,200 points. The MacBook Air M1 with no fan, let me stress this, no fan, is able to get 1,600 points. And same with, like, when you get to multi-core um, performance, so that's, like, you know, multi-threaded apps, things like video rendering and beefier things, that's also significantly, it scored 6,200 points just about uh, on the MacBook that's Air lot. Holy crap, M1. Yeah. It's a lot because it is the XPS 13, the t Intel 10th gen, Intel 10th gen XPS 13 that I reviewed earlier this year. Um, that one scored 4,600 points. So... In this respect, you know, the XPS 17, the Zephyrus G14 in multi-core, these are much more powerful chips. So these scored around 7,700 points. And that is the sort of difference, right? That's why you buy a beefier system. But the fact that I, an Air with no fan, no fan can get 6,200 is, is wild. Yeah. 
A, w- a word on benchmarks, right? I think that people sometimes question if benchmarks A can be gamed or B, how useful are they for real world observation? And I think that the point of having benchmarks is for comparison against other systems. Sure. So we're putting these machines all through the same sets of tests and the results are kind of how to compare because otherwise based on real world use, I'm just gonna be like, this, this thing took fast. three seconds. Yeah, yeah. Th- this thing took three seconds to render my Photoshop edit, whereas that thing took... 2.5 seconds like it's hard to you tell don't so, know. yeah you, people might be skeptical about benchmarks and i myself am sometimes um but as a point of comparison i do think that they're pretty sure, useful sure, sure. yep hey listen i'm sure a lot of the online commentary at once the unbiased you know reporting <laughs> like literally benchmarks are that is the most unbiased things can get it is just numbers Un- seen by performing the same test you know and i'm just writing down the numbers so <laughs> As, as someone go. who's been covering <laughs> mobile yep. phones for a long time yep. and remembering when companies used to game the benchmarks, this is yes. why I'm a little bit like nervous about relying too heavily for on sure. benchmarks, sure. right? Because sometimes they tweak their system to detect like, oh, you're running Geek yep. Bench, let me bump up this thing. So that was definitely, that was a thing, but that was also a thing by like second, third right. tier, you know, right. it was like, a, like, please notice us, like, like please. Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was not a great thing. It was not something you expect an Apple to do or like a, a major company. But hey, anyway, those are the benchmarks. I think the <laughs> system's really good. Um, I'm looking forward to like getting this back in my hands and doing some further testing. Uh, I really want to bench the MacBook Pro M1 and the Mac Mini. We haven't even really reviewed a Mac Mini ever, I think. But I really want to see what it works like, um, you know, with this new hardware. Cool. Do we want to move on to? Should we uh, send a, a do a CTA? Yeah. Ask people to sure, sure, sure. Yeah, do that. Like, yeah, do that. I'll do that. Uh. <clears throat> so those are my thoughts on the MacBook Air M1. If you have any questions, if you want to chat about this, email us at podcastandgadget.com. Uh, we definitely want to, you know, report on this thing further. So I've just seen my review so, so far, and that was like with a week with this machine. But I'm sure we'll learn more as we test it further. Okay, good. Here are a bunch of questions because everyone is very, very curious about yep. this machine. So first question from uh, Gimmin uh, says, how long do you think it will take for major apps to adapt to the M1 architecture? I think a lot of them are. Well, all the Apple apps have already been updated. Microsoft announced that Office um, is still running in Rosetta, but it's kind of been... They've given people some heads up, right? Office will take a little while to load, but once it's loaded in Rosetta, it seems to work really well. And Adobe says, um, I believe Photoshop and a lot of the like major Adobe apps are coming soon for native M1. But also here's the thing, it's not a huge, like it's not the huge performance difference that would make it so that you can't use any of these apps, right? So if you're relying on Adobe software, if you're relying on Office for some reason, you can still do your work and your experience will probably still be faster than your current Mac. So I think in that respect, you don't even really have to wait. It's really more about specialized software, the things that rely on like weird external devices um, where there are gonna be some downsides. I think the one disappointing bit of news we saw was that the M1 chip does not support external GPU enclosures. Mm -hmm. And I think I had mentioned this as we were previewing it, um, that, hey, that could be really useful for these machines. Those, Those things are cool. Those are basically boxes for plugging in desktop GPUs to get better graphics or rendering performance on your on your PC. But the M1 just doesn't support it. That's a shame and I'm hoping that's something they bring to maybe further additions of their systems on a chip. Because um, it could be great for the Mac Mini. It could be great for the MacBook Pro. For the MacBook Air, I don't, I don't think too many people are gonna do eGP stuff, but it is a little disappointing, yeah. Yeah, especially uh, for like Mac Pro and I think MacBook Pro. Sure, I, yeah, I was sure. going to say that I saw, I think it was this week that, what was it, Chrome was n- launching his native uh, yeah. ARM-based version of 4, m- the MacBook Air. I wonder if they could do that uh, for, I don't know, Windows on ARM or just optimize their performance for Windows on ARM. Because, like, you know, on, they're man. Meanwhile, I, I feel like every developer, every Windows on ARM developer <laughs> is like Tommy Lee Jones and The Fugitive. They're just like, I don't care. I don't care about this. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to build apps for this platform where nobody's because, buying Windows on ARM PCs. That's the main because thing. Because they don't have the threat of what Apple is doing, which is in two sure. years, none of your apps are going to be supported if you don't upgrade. That's so, not true. Did, well, you, they're did, making the transition to non-Intel versions. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's what I'm saying. In two years, the, get them up to Universal. Sure, but that that deadline is a Sherlin deadline. That deadline is not <laughs> Apple saying we're going to kill your okay. app in two years. No, we're because what I'm saying right apps. now is, is the emulation works. Like if if the developers don't do anything, Rosetta's. Wait, was it Rosetta? That's not going to be Rosetta Rosetta's not be around for forever. By the way, you know that it's right? Not going to be around forever, but. Right now, it's quite least, clear on their developer mm -hmm. page. They said that uh, Rosetta is not meant to be a permanent solution, and they want developers. This just buys developers' yeah, time. Yeah, it buys developers' time, but it, it won't just be two years. Like it's it's a little longer than that typically. So yeah. there sure. was an, uh, yeah. another question about whether um, things will work. Uh, there was a question about whether or not like Steam would work, and specifically the game City Skylines. Uh, I think that was probably answered already. Just well, in, if like, how uh, I, I well don't know about Rosetta does. I don't know about City Skylines in particular. So I did. So when I ran Fortnite, that was Rosetta emulated Fortnite, still running at 60 FPS in 1440p, or no like slightly above 720p. So if that game already runs on Macs, um, then it will, at least from my experience, will be fine on the M1, but you should just look into all this stuff. Cause I tried to launch Hades, which is another game on the Epic store. And that one didn't launch at all on the MacBook Air, even though I believe it does work on mm. Intel Mac. So there are, there are some weird differences from what we've seen um, I have talked to a couple developers outside of like Apple's really glowing developer videos, and <laughs> they were very excited by this. It doesn't seem like it's very difficult to bring their apps over, but a game is much more complex than just you know a productivity app. So that may take longer. Another question. Uh, I think this is closer to benchmarks. What's mm -hmm. the R20 score? Have you run the R20 score? I have not the Cinebench R20 score. We don't typically run Cinebench. That's not like mm -hmm. we haven't had that in our database. I've used that a couple of times when we're running like uh, really, really high end systems or like, um, big GPU work, but yeah, Cinebench isn't something we typically run. For those people who are watching and asking about benchmarks, mm -hmm. so if you have like good ideas for what sorts of like repeatable tests we can use, currently we use of like a few different things that, I mean, one of them, the vendor came out with, which is like a com video conversion test. And then we rely a lot mm -hmm. on the, you know, geek benches, 3d marks, PC marks that are yeah. out there. But if you have ideas, send them to us podcast at engadget.com. This one, by the way, ran pretty well on our video conversion test because it uh, it turned a 4K video clip, I believe, in like a minute and 30 seconds. Um, it transformed it to 1080p. And I think on a really high-powered PC or really like something like the MacBook Pro 16-inch with a super powerful chip, that took like 40 to 50 seconds. Yeah. So I wouldn't really use the MacBook Air for like heavy-duty video work, but it can do some things. Like it can actually do some of this work, which is surprising. So another question, and Ruta asks, in terms of programming, what's the support on the M1 right now? Uh, it can run virtual machines, right? I think, well, both Parallels, Parallels has announced that they are working on an M1 version to virtualize, you know, Windows and virtualize other things. So yeah, it can support virtual machines just fine. It's up to, to those developers to really optimize for it. Uh, one thing we do lose with these M1 chips is bootcamp support which was the thing that came around with the Intel chips where you could literally just install Windows in a partition on your hard drive and reboot your system into Windows, which was kind of wild. And I remember when that was first released and I was working in IT, like a lot of people were like, I, get, get me some Windows on this Mac, please, because <laughs> then I can run all sorts of things. So I had to get really good at learning how to partition Windows and image those things really quickly. That was a cool feature. It was a nice thing to have, but that, you know, We've we've moved beyond that. It is 2020 now. It's 15 years since the move to Intel Max. I think if you're gonna need some Intel, if you're gonna need some Windows apps, you're probably gonna be running Parallels or VMware or something. And I think just based on the raw performance of this chip, it should be fine. But hey, we'll see. We haven't tested those yet. And then there was a uh, c conversation after that question about mm -hmm. Xcode build time, and apparently the M1 does pretty well with Xcode. Sure. Okay. I, uh, that's beyond me because I'm not <laughs> a developer. Haven't <laughs> I'm not a developer. Yeah. Um, and then I think maybe the last question is uh, from Dennis asking whether or not eight, uh, the eight gigabyte RAM M1 would be enough for a student. Yeah, for a student, sure. Eight gigabytes is fine. I've tested a bunch of eight gigabyte laptops recently too, and totally fine, totally usable, as long as you don't like, if you're the sort of person that has 
dozens of browser tabs open and you're editing video or audio and you're just doing a lot of stuff at once. If you want to, you know, stream video while while actually doing some work or something, um, you really wouldn't be a game streamer with a Mac. But if you want to do any of those things, then the more RAM, the better. Uh, I really think it's more like how long do you plan to keep the system? If you want it to last you four to five years, please spend that money for that extra RAM because you you have no choice to upgrade. Like if you if you end up bottlenecking your RAM in two or three years, it's not like you could just go in and add more RAM. It's all part of the system on the chip. So spend that money up front to really reduce headaches over time. I feel like that's the best advice I could give you. And speaking of which, like it, it depends on what kind of student you're talking about. You sure. Know, if you're yeah. talking about any kind of like uh, CAD situation or even- You shouldn't be um, looking at this machine at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about like game design or something, you know, very specific rendering, then it's probably like, it's very possible that you're not asking that question at all because you already know like yep. what you need in terms of computer hardware. But if you're talking about like CAD or game, game stuff in general too, like any heavy development work, 16 gigabytes of RAM may not be enough. And that's that's a potential issue with this M1 chip uh, because right now the 13 inch MacBook Pro is also limited to 16 gigabytes of RAM as is the M1 uh, Mac mini. So that's why Apple's still keeping the Intel versions of those computers around. If you need 32 gigabytes of memory, then you have to use an Intel chip for now at least. Maybe next year that'll change. So there's one last question from Abik in the chat. Um... A, he actually asked a very similar question to mm -hmm. what we just answered. So I'm thinking thinking that he just joined recently. He's saying that he recently entered college and per, and is pursuing computer science engineering. Is the M1 okay for programming? I think we just talked about how that yep. is like it's getting there. And since Mac is you know one of the big places where developers do their work, it's very likely that it's all going to be supported within the next year to year and a half. It depends on the kind of developers, though, because I know they're the Linux hounds who will only you know work within a Linux system. They're the people who prefer Windows because then you can see you can run like you're building for the be the biggest ecosystem. But if you're going for programming, um, like the M1 will, will be just as fine as any other Mac. It's more of a the platform you need to think about. Are you going to be programming for iOS devices? Are you going to be programming for Macs and stuff? If you're going to be building for Windows, then it gets more complicated. But hey, you can always run Parallels or something, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. OK, so I think that might be it for these questions. A uh, reminder to everybody in the chat, like you are watching the raw recording of yeah. all of this. So if you're thinking like, wow, OK, these people are like going on and on about all sorts of stuff. Uh, yeah, this isn't the edited version of the podcast. Um, <laughs> You're watching the uncut. Yeah, unfiltered. you're watching the the uncut, unfiltered version. And so if mm -hmm. you're thinking like, wow, I would really like a more boiled down version of this, that's what I'm doing later on today. Although you're probably not watching this video stream then, you know. Um, I, th I think like nobody, nobody's tuning into YouTube streams and being like, I want less of this, you know. That's true. That's yeah, true. yeah. Like, I tune into YouTube when I want to like mainline my hardware in yeah, video YouTube game. YouTube is a maximalist so. <laughs> platform. Uh, okay. We are going to move on with the rest of the show. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and ch -ch -ch -ch. Okay. There we go. Yep. Now onto a quick update of our never ending election from 2020. <laughs> um, hey, things are looking pretty good in Georgia. Our, our recount came in and it very much leans to Biden. So that is very nice. Um, but there, there is some news and of course, like things there, there are always signs of things, uh, just going badly. Um, <laughs> earlier this week, uh, Donald Trump fired the U S cybersecurity director, Christopher Krebs. And this is a guy who basically has had a target on his back over the last couple of weeks because his work at the, at the cybersecurity department, I guess, like he runs cybersecurity for the country and was working on election security. And for the longest time, they ran basically a portion of their site, which was just uh, dismissing um, conspiracies and like debunking rumors. And for the past couple of weeks, all they've been doing is debunking Donald Trump. So when the president would be like, oh, man, this election is rigged. There's, there's a ton of illegal votes. The USCIS would basically be like, 
no, this is the most secure election we've ever had, and there is no evidence of anything bad. USCIS. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It's a it's a thing. I believe that's the acronym, but the, yeah, that's the What's Citizens that? and Immigration Services, or <laughs> that's something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, but the the cybersecurity department would basically be like, um, yeah, n nothing you're saying is true. So he was basically saying the emperor has no clothes for the past uh, <laughs> for the past week. Good couple don't of weeks. Worry so anything. He was fired in a, in a tweet. He, I think, was fully expecting it. I think he told papers that he was going to he was expecting to be fired soon. So, hey, if, if we when we look back at the history of this election and kind of the influence of technology and misinformation, and everything. This guy will uh, will be remembered as somebody who actually tried to fight against misinformation. So shout out to this guy. Shout out to Christopher Krebs. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more of him down the line. One thing I also want to bring up was if you were on Twitter, I believe it was Monday night <laughs> for a single hour, <laughs> one county in Michigan um, <laughs> was basically trying to avoid certifying the election for Joe Biden, which I thought... That was just a really strange thing because it was in Wayne County, which is uh, covers very heavily Democratic cities like Detroit, I believe. And it was uh, two members of that uh, that county's board that was just really trying to not not uh, not recognize the results of the election. And eventually they reversed their decisions and, um, you know, they were shouted down by other members of the board. But it just feel, it, it was a wild hour on Twitter <laughs> where it looked like. These these people just don't want to actually uh, count the results of the election. So that felt weird. It also showed to me, it proved like the drama of Twitter, right? Like so much can happen within an hour, this big controversy. And then a couple of minutes later, oh, no, everything has been reversed. But it's still a thing that happened. You know, I don't want us to forget <laughs> the history just because it happened so quickly. And um, I think the last story I saw about this, too, is that they're even trying to the people who were trying to block the certification or trying to rescind their uh, approval of it now, it's a whole thing. But hey, Twitter. Twitter is a really interesting thing to watch uh, as all this news is coming down fast. Because <laughs> if you're just looking at the news headlines, you're not. You're only getting part of the story, right? It, it, it is just kind of wild how much info you can get at once. That's also the danger of Twitter. But Sherlyn, tell me more about the danger of Twitter and too much <laughs> so Twitter. I know. Yeah. Speaking of Twitter and things maybe not lasting forever on Twitter and not, you know, just happening for an hour, uh, <laughs> this week Twitter rolled out Fleets, the Instagram stories uh, competitor on its website. So if you use Twitter at all, you'll have seen a new row of icons at the top of your page. Uh, basically, if you've never used Instagram stories or Snapchat, which it's OG, which is where Instagram stole this from. Um, <laughs> These are, you know, little videos or things that take up the whole of your phone screen. And, uh, you know, people can post text, images, videos, uh, and they live only for 24 hours before going away. So this is, uh, I mean, first of all, what Twitter? Why? I want an edit button. I don't <laughs> want this, but okay. Do thank you want you. an edit button? We, we, we've talked about this in previous we've episodes, whether or not. This, but, yeah, well, we yeah. can... We can talk about the edit button later, but it was my joke. It was my joke that I can't get an edit button, but I can get stories. Um, and I mean, yeah, people have been going wild on Twitter, clearly, uh, because not only is it, you know, something that's new for people to try out on Twitter, you can reach different audience on Twitter as opposed mm -hmm. to on Instagram stories. But it's also kind of, and, and these reports have been coming out, it's ripe for harassment and for flouting sure. some of Twitter's uh, guidelines and policies. So because these are la like 24 hours only and they're in stories, so they're basically in videos, Twitter's system might not be looking at them as closely right. as they're looking at your written tweets. I don't think um, anybody was asking for this. That's my main takeaway. It's like yeah. we don't we don't need more Twitter that is unfiltered and unchecked, right? I will say I suspect mm -hmm. uh, that Twitter's whole thing for implementing this was they saw the success of Instagram stories. Sure. Because sure. no one, I mean my friends and I have been talking about this forever now, but like no one posts their grid anymore. Everyone's just posting stories. Um, and people look at them all the time. People are posting them all the time. If you're looking at, if you're a company sure. like Twitter and you're looking at bumping your daily active user numbers, this might be, a, they, maybe they felt like this was a way, right? So it's, I feel it's like just, that's it's why. It's funny because like Twitter and hey, everybody forgets about Snapchat too. It's like Instagram stories was so successful, but it was really they Facebook stole it just from Snapchat. stealing, stealing everything, yeah. you know, and then, that, that's the thing. 
someone uh i think uh one of the people i follow was like oh i've posted more fleets than i have facebook stories and true mm -hmm. because facebook sure. stories is a garbage hole i think sure. anyway because i don't and it's also facebook. separate from instagram stories separate and... from instagram uh, stories so uh, dumb okay Although don't say that because now Facebook will force them to merge. Please do not put your dumb Instagram uh, Facebook stories on my Instagram. But anyway, uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. So someone's already like you know said that they've used fleets more. Again, I think that for me, the way I think about it is like it's a very different audience that I'm reaching on Twitter. Um, yes, some of my Twitter followers also follow me on Instagram, but I feel like for me, Instagram is more a close knit thing. More of my friends sure. from home and friends here have Instagram than Twitter, yeah. um, and so like. Yeah, I, I, I'm torn. I, I'm personally not going to use fleets all that much. I just do it for the being in the zeitgeist and having fun. Um, but yeah. the, the whole potential for harassment is also an issue because when people reply to your tweets, those are public. Mm -hmm. When people reply to your stories or your fleets, those are private. Um, and people, I think, feel more emboldened to say whatever the hell they want in a private right. reply. Even though you can, yes, still snatch, uh, screenshot them and share them if you want mm -hmm. to shame this person, but it, it does open up this like other channel for people to get in touch with you. And yeah. who knows whether that's going to be a good or bad thing. I think that that might not be great. So Twitter clearly has a lot to think about. And it did say that it is looking at how to police this a little bit better. It's, it's more um, like, I don't know why... Especially after everything Twitter, like all the criticism Twitter has faced over the last few years, why you would release a new vector for basically abuse because it's a new vector yeah. for engagement and engagement on the Internet equals eventual abuse um, right. without thinking about how you would protect people. Because I think, I think it, this is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right, they don't they don't they care more about getting those engagement numbers up rather than making sure their users are safe. And this is the consistent problem we've had with social media over the last few years mm -hmm. too. So I'll say this, um, to me, it just feels redundant because isn't the whole point of Twitter is to just get your Be, bullshit out there. Right, exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Just, sometimes like I actually miss the point where we were just like tweeting about dumb things and not Anything, just the fate yeah. of democracy. So I do kind of like to throw out those tweets some nights of just like a dumb thing and then people would <laughs> start engaging with it. Hey, that's fun. But that's I what literally I do exclusively. don't- just right. dumb tweets. That's all I do. Just dumb tweets at night. I've seen your feed. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I have no reason to produce a tweet that will disappear in 24 hours. Uh, maybe they're chasing some of the users. I've seen some like high profile users who would just like yeah. do a couple tweets, let them sit for a while and delete the tweets. So maybe right. they're trying to like, I think like Jibuki, the comedian is like a good mm. example of that where he would sometimes tweet like a really extreme joke at times just to see like uh. what it is and kill it before he gets like censored by Twitter. So I, I don't know, maybe they're looking at that engagement strategy and trying to figure out how to do it. Um, I am looking forward to never tweet, never fleeting, <laughs> always tweeting. Yeah. I'm, I'm just impressed by how quickly like the Twitter verse has already picked up on like a new lingo. For example, sure. do you know that fleet Twitter is called Flitter? <sighs> And there's already someone no. who's claimed the Bat Fleets account. So if you tweet an ex uh, if you fleet, excuse me, an extreme joke, you, someone's gonna see it and screenshot it and send it to Bat Fleets, and it'll live there forever. So don't think that just because fleets are disappearing that you'll be off the hook. Nothing on the internet is temporary. Everything on the internet is permanent. <laughs> <laughs> who was it? Uh, there, there was like the Twitter video of one. Was it a politician or a media person who was like slowly realizing? You mean Snapchat things can be saved, and what I say <laughs> in Snapchat, people can remember. That's bad. You mean screen because I have been very script? bad things. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So Twitter, um, Twitter is getting dumber. It's getting dumber. TLDR. And, and yeah, and the one final one, yeah, right, exactly. What's yeah. next? So one of my favorite tweets about you know fleets since it rolled out was mm -hmm. by Ashley Mayer. She goes, Twitter's product roadmap, fleets, colon, stories, but on Twitter, beats, Spotify, but on Twitter, right. meets, Tinder, but on Twitter. And mm. finally, I don't know if we can say this on a podcast, but mm. T E E T S, uh, <laughs> only fans. Oh, it's so a scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't know. We can and can't say. Um, but I thought that was hilarious. Uh, and yeah, who knows what else Twitter might be cooking in its little Twitter kitchen back there.
we can move on. <laughs> we, should we move on yeah, or answer yeah, questions? No let's, or? no, let's just go straight to Amazon Pharmacy. Cool. Go for it. All right. Okay. Well, let, let me let me let me throw this to you. Um, okay, Sherlyn, that all sounds terrifying. Tell me something <laughs> that doesn't sound as dumb as Twitter fleets, um, such as Amazon getting into pharmacies. What? Uh, I don't know if it doesn't sound as dumb. I guess it's not as dumb. Um, <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. I'm being I know. sarcastic. Yeah. Long, long time listeners know that telehealth is a recent pet topic of mine. Mine, and ever since I've been covering, you know, digital pharmacies and digital like uh, medical health services, um, I've had this suspicion that Amazon was working on this in the background, just because you kind of know they're getting into it. This is like three years ago when I first interviewed the founder of Row. Uh, which is the uh, online, I don't even know how to describe them. I don't think pharmacy is the right word, but anyway. Um, and I have been asking them like, Amazon's just gonna do this and put you out of business maybe. Yeah. There is a difference though, between what Amazon is doing and uh, it's the competitors or the existing startups in the space are doing. But let's let's explain this a little bit. So Amazon announced this week, um, the service called pharmacy. It's mm -hmm. not like Amazon's not been delivering medicine to your door before, and now it's just got a more unified storefront to do it. It's really working with insurance providers directly, and it's trying to help you. It, it can be the prescriber for some medications that you need. And it is specifically uh, for a certain type of medication. So nothing that is uh, classified FDA type two, which is a little more controlled, mm -hmm. but the uh, prescriptions that are, you know, that you can maybe ask Amazon pharmacy for include things like birth control. Um, I'm getting up the, the complete sure. list. It, it Does it cover things like a lot of the startups we're seeing now too? Cause there are a bunch of medical startups, um, you know, things like, yeah. Cute and for him, which offer yeah. like erectile dysfunction drugs and hair, yep. like, you know, stuff for your hair to keep your hair from receiving. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole premise of those startups too, because mm -hmm. they, they operate in the same space of like lower danger drugs, right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. non, not, not so controlled substances. And yes, that is the same space. Uh, but the, the criticism of Amazon pharmacy so far from people in the industry and like, for example, the founder of, uh, co-founder of Rose Z, who mm -hmm. we've spoken to on the show before says that it would have been great to see Amazon remove middlemen to drive even lower prices for patients rather than exacerbating some of the largest problems of the current system. But overall, they believe more competition is good for mm -hmm. patients. Basically it's, it's not to me. You're, I mean, people are still going to have to rely on their insurance providers for some of these. Right. If you have insurance, you know, you have a way and you have a, another option. But the problem is right now, most people are already using some sort of pill delivery service. Mm -hmm, you've mm -hmm. got Express Scripts, you've got Walmart, CVS. Yeah. Even, even CVS is doing it now. They've all adapted, right. which is great. So who's going to switch over to Amazon? If your insurance, yeah. also your insurance provider is the one that determines who's your, your right, pharmacy. Right. So you're just going to listen to them. And really, who you should be serving in this case are the people who don't have to be, you know, who are, aren't covered by insurance, mm -hmm. who don't have to be like, oh, my insurance provider makes all the decisions, right? If you're, you have the freedom of choice, that's where you might consider something like that. And for, and Amazon's not doing a lot here to make it easier for those people, basically. Um, it, it It's fine if you have a prime subscription and you're really into the Amazon ecosystem, but you know, other services, I know we bring up Row a lot, but that's just one of the brands I'm most familiar with. Um, they do kind of like the everything, right? From from when you start to feel like you have symptoms, you go to the website, or when you have questions about what it is you want to take, like erectile dysfunction, dysfunction mm -hmm. medicine, um, you go there, you fill out a questionnaire, you get to talk to a doctor, and you know, it's all like a more personal process. Mm -hmm. And Amazon Pharmacy, I, I mean, I haven't tried it yet, but it, it just seems a little bit more distant than that for sure i mean that, that's the whole amazon thing i do wonder if they're catering right. to people who are just lazy and don't want to go through you know a lot of the processes because row and for him they a lot of them involve like answering questions and going through right. like, a bit of a medical thing like um as someone like, yeah yeah <laughs> as someone who's had really bad experiences before mm -hmm. like i've been in the er okay from yeah. medication that i got through a website like that Ugh. um and, and like, mm -hmm. it just was bleeding for months on end, nonstop. Mm -hmm. It was bad. Okay. So I would say I prefer the comfort and the security, sure. uh, the perceived security of talking to a medical mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that Amazon seems to be reaching those people who don't care. 
Yeah. Whatever it is, this is these are pills that you're taking. Like it, it will affect your body. Like you might think it's nothing, but it's actually it matters. <laughs> it matters. And it's more. I don't know if we can trust Amazon as a delivery for such essential things, just because they've done a bad job of even keeping their actual marketplace safe uh, from counterfeiters and from all sorts of things too. Exactly. Like I don't. This is a company that I will always think of like, oh, they'll get into something because I can make a lot of money from it rather than being like, oh, I can genuinely make this better help. for exactly. everybody and genuinely help. Like Amazon doesn't really care about that. I'm interested to see where this goes because we need more solutions for getting medication. Uh, the way things work in America just aren't great. But yeah, it, it sucks because we're all still beholden basically to our insurance providers. I don't quite right. know what space Amazon is fitting in here. And I also like some of the companies like for hymns and keeps, like I like that they're around. It's easy to get access to certain things. Yep. Like, Hey, I've, I've occasionally will order things from for hymns to keep my hair from falling out too much, you know, right. because if I stop right. that now, it's much easier than, uh, you know, fixing it later. So yeah. I have liked that process and that's been pretty easy and I've used them just fine. But I right. don't know if I trust Amazon to give me the right things because I don't trust Amazon in general, right? And and, and yeah, I, I agree. And I think for me, um, to be clear, Roe doesn't just do erectile dysfunction. They have yeah. also menopausal symptom like alleviating um, options too. So it's like it's not just for men; it's for everything. But like mm -hmm. Bob Herman, the one of the health reporters for Exius, I think put it really nicely. Uh, he said on Twitter. Amazon's new pharmacy seems more like rearranging deck chairs, mm -hmm. plus also mm -hmm. rebranding its uh, pill pack acquisition from a while ago than yep. actual disruption. Amazon's not doing anything really new here. It's just entering a space that's burgeoning and maybe looking at how I can profit. Also, I don't know how comfortable I want I am with Amazon knowing what pills I take and just reminding yep. me the way it does. Like, hey, do you want to refill your dried mangoes and also your prescription? Yeah. Like, no. Leave me alone. <laughs> How many dry mangoes do you order from Amazon, Trillin? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess especially um. recently, it, it is a good way. But that is a common thing I pick up at like the health food store. But it is much harder to I do that safely mangoes. around. Yeah, they're very good. They're very good. Yeah. Uh, Shout okay. out to dried okay. mangoes. Where's the startup <laughs> disrupting uh, dried fruit delivery? I, I, know. I would love some of that. They're really? actually, it's snack box and some of those, right? That's probably them. what you go for. Let's like, move on yeah. to listener email, but I yep. do want to mention that the chat has uh, gone from saying like, oh, it could be Amazon prescriptions to Amazon medical marijuana to- Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> that would be- Like, yes, yes. Amazon I'm sure is many just people would dealer. Of like, course yeah. why it not? would. There are, there are more and more states. New Jersey yeah. just legalized it. Mm -hmm. um, New Amazon York, drugs. Is, is I cannot wait for like the dirtbag dealer Jeff Bezos memes. Basically, yeah. <laughs> like, New York is oh, probably Lord. going to legalize it within the next year and a half yeah. or something because that's something that happens. The dominoes start falling when yeah. a neighboring state legalizes marijuana. Yeah. I'm actually then, surprised. Amazon, like this whole thing should just be like, where, where's Amazon CBD, just auto delivery, just give it to me. Like we're in the middle of a pandemic. We all need to be relaxed. Like the thing Amazon should be doing is just optimizing CBD delivery <laughs> to every single person on yeah. the planet because we all need it. I'm seeing, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There is the enormous Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. This guy looks like he could be a bouncer or like mm -hmm. an ex wrestler or something. <laughs> He's like six, eight. I think he refused to live in the Lieutenant Governor's mansion of Pennsylvania specifically because like those old ass houses are not designed for a man that large. Sure. sure. And uh, one of the things that he's most passionate about is legal weed for uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, like Jesse uh, Ventura with yeah. a Harvard education. That's awesome. Love it. Love it. Anyway, I, I anyway. just let's... wanted to quickly shout out uh, on the stream DJ Jackson's joke about Amazon Basics marijuana that you yes. were alluding to. Yes, Am yes. Amazon Basics weed. It like oh, people were talking Lord. about like whether or not you know you order snacks and then they'll try to like pair. <laughs> Yeah. Amazon basic laxative. Oh my gosh. Oh god. Okay, yeah, let's move on. We've got listener email. <laughs> let's move so. on. Let's do this. Yes. Okay. Oh. I will I can introduce this one. Yeah. Uh, and we can tell people to yeah. send their emails through. Sure, sure, sure. <clears throat> let's move on to a listener email we received a couple of weeks ago. Apologies for the delay in addressing this. Uh, Mark Dell, who is in the chat right now, 
But hey, if anybody else wants to shoot us emails, uh, podcast and gadget.com, we would love to take your questions and it's a good way to just make us think about things in different ways. So Mark Dell is asking, he was thinking about getting a System76 laptop to try something a little different than just having a Windows or a Mac. He knows he could just use Pop! OS, uh, which is a Linux distro on another device, but he's curious about the whole experience. Have we tried these devices? What do we think? Um, so System76 is a company that builds um, Linux specific hardware, right? Without Windows or without anything on them. Sherlyn, have you heard of this company? I have not used any of them. No. Okay. Yeah. I haven't used them either, but I've heard things from people. Um, I just always, I just can't quite see the point of them. I can understand like having, just buying a laptop that has, you know, a fully compatible Linux distro built in that is already, you know, addressed all the driver issues and everything like is just a pick up and go Linux machine. But at the same time, I do feel like the hardware looks fine. The internals are great, but I don't know if I can trust the case designs. I don't know if I can trust the reliability of this hardware, whereas you can buy something from, you know, yeah, any Windows PC maker, hey, get the get the XPS 13 I love so much, um, <laughs> for pretty much the same price. Because the thing about Linux machines is that it used to be you were getting them significantly cheaper because you're not paying for Windows license. But right now, it doesn't really matter. Like, you could get the XPS 13, not spend much more than, you know, any of these System76 systems and have a lot better hardware to deal with just because that screen is so beautiful. Like Dell is just doing such great work. And I think you get better support too. Um, I always am wary about the product support I get from smaller companies, but hey, if anybody else has tried System76 and you wanna chime in and tell us what your experience has been, definitely let us know. But yeah, I think those are my thoughts. Like get an XPS 13, get like, there are so many good Windows laptop options. Uh, one thing um, I've seen people recommend is look for refurbished, corporate laptops, especially like refurbished ThinkPads, which you can usually get for real cheap for like under 500 bucks. And it may be a couple years old, but it's perfectly suited for Linux. That's an option too. Okay. For Linux, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was going to say that like I have heard of and have personally had issues with Lenovo devices in general. So I'm like, Lenovo is built hold off on that ThinkPad. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, those are not great. The refurbished ThinkPads not going to be that great with like break in. Mm -hmm like 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good call is just like look for refurbished other, mm -hmm. other brand devices mm -hmm. and yeah, run your Pop! OS on there. Uh, cool. Do you want to do an email shout out? I, I can do it. I think, yeah, we, I mean, we just if, did. I mean, he already did one at the start yeah. of this segment. Okay, yeah, no. Yeah, we just did it. All right. So yeah, that is how the sausage is made. Um, yeah. I on. definitely support um, doing... Um, uh, like corporate refurbish laptops yeah. because they're usually very gently used. You can yeah. find them on eBay or something else like that. And IT departments tend to pick like resilient machines. So yes. the the consumer ThinkPads are actually a little different than like the stuff that gets sent out to corporate customers too. So that could be part of the difference there. Okay, okay. let's move to working on. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on to what we've been working on. I just want to shout out my reviews of the uh, of AMD's Radeon RX 6800 and 6800 XT. Uh, these are AMD's first high-end GPUs in a very long time. And these are competing directly with the new stuff from NVIDIA. So specifically the RTX 3080 and 3070. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, so it's pretty cool. Um, I really like the 6800 XT. Uh, it is 650 bucks in benchmarks. It performs better than the 699 RTX 3080. So it, it, like AMD is here to really compete. Um, the 6800 is in a weirder spot because it's 579 and it's kind of competing with the RTX 3070. That card typically goes for around 499. Like ideally it should be 499. So it is faster than the 3070, but in some ways I think the, when I review that thing, I think the 3070 is a great deal in general, because it gets you great gaming performance and great ray tracing. And ray tracing, both of these cards have hardware accelerated ray tracing. It's something we've been waiting to see for a while from AMD. And we know they could do it because both the PS5 and the Xbox Series S and X can, can handle that, you know? So AMD's hardware is powering those, uh, those consoles. And the ray tracing on these cards, it's fine. But it's very Ooh. slow. It's not like it's not anywhere near what NVIDIA is offering at this point. So you could really tell that NVIDIA has at least a year 
head start in terms of implementing and optimizing ray tracing. So I would not, you, you can't run some games with ray tracing on these cards like Dirt 5, which also runs on the, the consoles just fine. But something like Control, which kills pretty much any system you put it on, if you crank up ray tracing, I could not play Control on any system with these cards. Um, whereas with the RTX 3080, you could still crank up ray tracing and use a couple optimizations to make Control really playable and still get you 60 FPS. I really missed NVIDIA's DLSS technology with these cards because that was a thing where they would render the game at a lower resolution, use AI optimizations to kind of upscale that lower resolution to get you something that looks similar to a true 4K image. But basically it means there's less graphical overhead on the card and on your system, uh, and the games still look good. Uh, AMD doesn't quite have something like that yet, but I hear they're working on a similar scaling feature. So anyway, these are interesting cards. Uh, I still think the 3070 is the best buy for most people right mm -hmm. now. But if you want a high-end card, the, the 6800 XT is cool. If you have a Zen 3 CPU, I believe you'll get even a bit of a performance bump because AMD has managed to make the, the memory interface uh, pretty seamless between its hardware. But even if you have an Intel system, like this will be a fast card. I just feel like the best deal is still the 3070 and the best overall performer without going up to the crazy ass, you know, $1,500 mm. 3090 is the 699 3080. So that's kind of where everything stands. Competition is good. And hopefully like now, maybe now NVIDIA will also look at AMD as more of a serious threat in the high-end space and not just the, the mid-range space. So. That's it. That's my GPU talk for the week. <laughs> I also want to shout out quickly. Uh, I wrote up uh, my experience using uh, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, the new VR experience that's hitting Oculus Rift headsets today. Um, that thing, it's super cool. Um, I, I've talked about Vader Immortal before, and that was a great like linear story set within VR, um, you know, and in the Star Wars universe, this one's a little more open-ended. So you play as a, um, as a droid repair technician who gets roped into this, like, um, you basically, was it the Guavian Death Squad? You encounter the Guavian Death Squad early <laughs> on in the game and you get stranded on Batu, and then you can just hang out on Batu. You can, you can hang out in, uh, when the cantina's there, you could go out into the wilds and hunt and, you know, collect items and stuff. It is kind of an open world game, but there are also elements of quests. Um, there's also like actual storytelling within it. Um, there's a quest where you know, if you collect a certain amount of ingredients for a drink, you can, um, the barkeep in the game will tell you a story about, uh, from the High Republic era, about a young Padawan and Yoda Ooh. from that time. So that's kind of cool that they can encapsulate mm. different stories within the framework of this game. That thing is only like, that specific experience is only 15 minutes long, but hopefully down the line, like we'll see more stories and hopefully they'll be longer. But overall, I think this is pretty cool. But if you're just getting an Oculus Rift or Oculus Quest, actually, if you're just getting an Oculus Quest one or two now, play Vader Immortal first. I think it is a much better like mainline experience, but this is a cool thing to play around with. Like, uh, let me tell you guys, I was watching the last episode of The Mandalorian and <laughs> loving the season, super good. We'll talk more about it later. But I immediately went from watching that show to jumping into this game in VR. And it just felt weird because I was like, oh, everything I was just watching on my TV, I'm just like jumping into it. And there's a weird sense of like cognitive dissonance in a way. Like it just felt uncanny to see how fully realized the Star Wars world is within VR. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought this was really cool. Um, if you have a Quest 2, definitely check it out. Sherlyn, what's up with you? Um, I have been working on some behind the scenes stuff, uh, reviewing a, a laptop that hopefully you guys will see the review next week. Um, and also doing some reporting for some year end stories that I talked mm -hmm. about, uh, last time as well. But this week, uh, thanks a lot, Google for the last minute event on Wednesday, which was yesterday. Um, you know, at 12 30 PM Eastern Google launched, uh, well, Google pay had an event basically introducing a re redesign of its app and a new thing called Plex by Google. It has to be Plex by Google because Plex is otherwise very widely known as the media server app, but never mind. Um, this is really, I think Plex sounds a lot like it might be an Apple card competitor, but it really is actually just, Google enabling some smaller banks and financial institutions to have a modern banking app. Um, 
one of the i mean that's why you will not see names like i think bank of america and capital sure. one on there because those guys have really good mobile app experiences already um but the first is this basically bank, google doing like simple like the simple like the online bank simple basically uh i'm actually not familiar with simple so i can't okay. i can't tell you what that is they, but they were like the been, only web-based bank for a very long time so that was like oh, the big thing with them so it does feel yeah. familiar yeah a little bit, but um, I mean, yeah, so you can apply for an account, you know, via the Google Pay yeah. app and, uh, you know, right now it's not available yet. You'll have to join the wait list. But so currently the uh, there are nine to 11 uh, financial institutions that have, you know, confirmed that they're going to be working on Plex mm -hmm. accounts. Uh, and one of them that announced yesterday as well as Citibank. And so it's the Cityplex account. Uh, there'll be what? No overdraft fees, no, uh, no overdrafts, no minimum ba balance requirement, no monthly fees, that sort of thing. But you can apply online. And the whole spiel is that you have this great like app experience, really. Uh, you'll manage, like you'll sign up and you won't get a card. You won't get a physical card, but you'll uh -huh. get a, a debit MasterCard. And then you'll also have, um, you know, access to pay, which, by the way, with the redesign is now like a mix of Venmo and Mint. Um, you can mm. do a lot of money transfers from there, which you could already do with pay. Um, but Google's redesigned the interface so that the home page focuses on the people and businesses you interact with the most. So, like, for example, if I were to pay Davindra a monthly, like, coffee for podcast fee. Yes, please um, do. No, thank you. He would show up on my homepage as one of the heads of people that I, you know, interact with a lot on Google Pay. Um, and then brands like, for example, Panera or I guess JCPenney or something like that. Are they still around? Anyway, um, <laughs> would be would be also showing up on there uh, if you make some sort of purchase at their store and want to pay via pay. So and then there's also the part of it that, again, is similar to what Apple was saying they wanted to do with Apple Card is to help people understand their finances better. Um, so it'll the the main differentiator here that Google has over competitors like I don't know Mint and other mobile banking apps too is the search function because mm -hmm. Google is so good at search obviously. So what you can do with the Google Pay app when you have all your you know bank accounts your cards like linked to it, you can search for something like gym or you know, you remember you bought a smoothie at the gym, but you can't remember how much it cost. Right. You can be like gym, and then it'll pull up all the transactions that are related to gyms based on like location, based on mm -hmm. brand name, or based on product name, whatever. Or even it can scan receipts that you've taken a photo of hmm. uh, in from your photos app or from Gmail. And that's, you know, of course you have to give it permission to access those accounts, but like then it will pull up those receipts and scan also for the information and show you the transaction you're thinking of. So that's one thing that really stands out about the new Google Pay app. Um, but by and large though, everything else seems like things that people have done before. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to be very interesting to see. For me, I'm like half interested in finance because, you know, taking care of mine and some sure. of my friends are super into it. Um, and half because it's Google and like, you know, and also one thing that I don't like about Google pay is that all your transactions, like your money transfers, like if I send you money, Devendra, mm -hmm. it'll be only visible by you and, um, me, which like is technically a good thing. It's actually a good thing. Yeah. But you want it to be I'm, fully public like Venmo. <laughs> exactly. Like if you're a Venmo stalker, this deal will not like this. So <laughs> we will have to I'm, I'm trying to figure out your priorities here, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, I've, well, I've always hated options. that. Yeah, Venmo, <laughs> Venmo gives, gives you, you options. options. But Venmo launched <clears throat> in this weird space where we were like, oh man, everything should be a social network. Everything should be public. Yeah, Let's share weird. money transactions for some reason. <laughs> and it's cute because you could put emojis next to it. I yeah. I never Let's understood that. Let's make it cute. <laughs> it's so dumb. Um, the only reason Venmo like really took off is that their processing is really fast and PayPal yeah. bought them and that was a whole thing. Um, I have to say, Sherlyn, I don't know if I can trust any of this because of my we'll just see. general distrust of Google, um, especially them getting directly into finances and seeing your receipts like, okay. I mean, they've already been able yeah. to do that. They're just making it, you know, within the finance app right now. Like you think yeah. Google couldn't see your receipts if you took a photo of it before? That doesn't make could. it better, Sherlyn. Like, I know. I'm not saying it it's, to be... I'm just saying like you're- Yeah, you're, now they're I, actually you using the fear. info. Yeah. Right. It shouldn't be new fear. It's like existing fear that continues it's existing to existing fear, exist. but also fear of Google. Like literally, they can tell all our transaction information, like from our email and everything too. But um, now they'll have even deeper details. On right. Yeah. So I was on a roundtable with the head of uh -huh. Google Pay, um, 
and a few other folks. And one of the things they brought up when I asked about the privacy and security mm -hmm. aspect is um, one thing is they won't share your transaction history uh, to be used for targeted ads, which is so important. I'm just like, okay, thank, thanks for saying that. Yeah. But it kind of makes me yeah. wonder what else is being, yeah. you know, tracked or searched. So I, I, I understand. I totally agree. There's a lot of like security concerns here. I, I mean, I personally want to try, I, I use Google Pay. So I'm going to like check it out and see if the redesign makes a difference. The problem is, I think Google will have a hard time convincing people to migrate from whatever service they're existing, they're currently right. using to use pay instead. So yeah. we'll see, we'll see. But that's what we'll I, part of what I was working on covering that event live was a uh, mm -hmm. was fun. I think no, it was not. <laughs> uh, it was a I mean, it's, it's always Wednesday. it's cool to have like an actual event where you have to like okay hustle and write news and talk. I, like, yeah, me, it there, was there's definitely a certain a energy with that. Yeah. So good job there, Shalin. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I think it's gonna be interesting to see, like, because yeah, we. We've seen the Apple Card. We've seen a bunch of stuff. I think it's just interesting to see how companies take advantage of this space. Um, yeah. Zelle is a thing. You know, uh, a lot of banks are using yep. to transfer money now because they want to have a way outside of PayPal and outside of Venmo. Um, right. The space is going to get more interesting. But man, I can't trust anybody involved with yeah. it. But I, I guess that's just normal. Anyway, well, any okay, if you're listening, mm -hmm. you know, if you're listening or watching and you're thinking of like the digital money transfer app you use, like Zelle, Venmo, Google Pay, whatever it is, send us like your thoughts. What are the wish list features you want? Like for me, international money transfer that's easy and seamless. I don't mm -hmm. care about paying a small fee each time. Right. Uh, right. That's a big wish list item for me. And yes, you can do mm -hmm. PayPal, but it's still not very easy. So and it's also limited. Us... PayPal and Venmo are like limited too. So yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. send, send, uh, whatever it is that makes it easy to send my mom money. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> send us your advice, your thoughts, and your wish list items. Yeah. Please uh, send your link. Yeah, mom all your money yeah yeah <laughs> where were they saying gadget.com oh my god right. i'm trying to get the email address out <laughs> all right let's move on to our picks and uh just just quickly i want to talk about the mandalorian season two which i i've already mentioned but love this freaking show it, it is a lot of fun it is a great the great thing about the mandalorian is that it is a quiet star wars show like it's a show that allows room for silence Amid the mm -hmm. like blaster shootouts and amid the like explosions <laughs> and chip in the chip uh, ship chases and everything, so it reminds me a lot of like the original trilogy and what we what a lot of people love about that. So I'm just really digging the season. Uh, it is leaning heavily on guest stars. I won't spoil too many of them here, but the first episode has Timothy Oliphant as a freaking you know space cowboy, and I am fully down with that. Like I, I think Oliphant should just be make him a cowboy in every single genre moving forward, you know, so say we all. Uh, I'm really digging Mandalorian S2, um, so I'm glad it's still around. You can really see the money on the screen because it's sort of like you're watching <laughs> a new Star Wars movie every year or every week, and that to me is pretty cool. It just feels like, man, I'm watching the future of entertainment here. Um, we've talked a bit about this before where they're doing this um, unique production design where essentially there are giant LED panels on a set that they can project uh, different sets and different worlds and environments wow. on. So they can create a lot of shots that look as if they're on location on an alien planet um, and actually make it more realistic. So the lighting mm. hits people, you know, uh, in a realistic way compared to just having a green screen and having a digital background. So I'm just really digging it. Uh, it's a really fun show and yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the season. <laughs> Sherlyn, what is your pick? I am waiting. I'm waiting for the uh, surprise. First, the thing you talked about with the giant LED screens uh -huh. uh, reminded me of like Samsung's events where they'd have like yeah. huge. <laughs> the that's basically it. Giant background. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that sounds amazing. Um, mm -hmm. My recommendations this week, I'm deviating slightly from the horror uh, picks. I want to, uh, I've been actually keeping these recommendations in a, like on the list for a while now. Cause I was like, okay, one day when I run out of ideas, I'll recommend these things. But uh, I think it's time now to, to kind of bring them up. So I, throughout the doom scrolling election, like days, I needed a break from all of that stuff. So uh, other than watching TV and whatever, uh, I found it most enjoyable to decompress by actually surprisingly watching some like, Instagram stories and TikToks sure, and whatever. Sure. 
I am a young, okay? Because you, like, you can also just like <laughs> lay down in bed and just I like could. lay flat well, and watch your No, but I want to be yeah. distracted because my brain yeah. is too like doom, doom, doom. Um, <laughs> so I want to start with the first one that really like brought a lot of like joy, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I have three to recommend you guys. So the first one is Grandmama. I think y'all might have heard of this uh, TikTok or TikTok and Instagram account mm -hmm. uh, where it's basically this mom and her son gray he is adorable mm -hmm. uh he just turned three and you you guys might know him from the uh video that went viral a while ago he uh he's the kid that always says thank you mama when she hands him a plate of food and she mm -hmm. posted a montage of like like just a lot of these in a row where every time she hands him a plate of food he goes thank you mama thank you mama thank you mama thank you mm -hmm. and he's like the thank you mama boy <laughs> Adorable. I mean, if you like cute baby content, there's a lot of it on Gray and Mama. I absolutely adore it. <laughs> um, it's so cute. Okay, the second uh, account that I started to watch around that time was Nicole Dubois, I think is how you pronounce her last name, um, mm -hmm. or at Nikki Dubes. She's a comedian. <laughs> and her, she has like different series of um, joke, like, I guess skits, right? And mm -hmm. one of them, which is my favorite, is the suburban mom character that she pulls out in place. And it's just her going, oh my God, are those flowers for me? Oh no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Have a nice day. And it's just like hilarious. <laughs> like I love a lot of the stuff that she does. And um, yeah, it was just, it's 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 a really great um, break from what's on Twitter for me just to watch this. And finally, the third one is this account called Brunch Boys. Turns out Brunch Boys' this creator um, is actually a regular listener of the Engadget podcast. Cool. Uh, Very cool. It's, yeah. I, was well, I will not make fun of the name Brunch Boys. But well, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I, I also miss being a brunch boy because that was, <laughs> brunch is one of the best things we had in the before times. You know? I know. Like, as much as people oh. would hate on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm confused because there's, I think, only one boy, but I don't uh, know why it's brunch boys. But I mean, maybe it's for all of you brunch boys. Anyway, it's all it's all um, brunch boys. Yeah, listen, let's say, let's though, shout out to brunch, the lost art brunch. of brunch that we that we lost because it was, I, I think, especially for overworked people like you and me, Sherlyn, who just like yes, will go through the week without like eating proper things. It was always <sighs> great to be able to just like go to a place, plop yourself down. <laughs> Yeah, and just telling a restaurant to please feed me while I yeah. have an all-you-can-drink mimosa God, or yeah. Bloody Mary well, or something like yeah. I mean, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, I always I'm not a morning person, so anytime I wake mm -hmm. up, it's time for brunch anyway. Right, um, right, but yeah, <laughs> it's a great I, meal for non-morning people because brunch exactly. lasts until three p.m. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm sometimes <laughs> not up yet by then, but anyway, uh, wow. point is, uh, the Brunch Boys account. Not only is it like amazing so proceed with caution because it's gonna make you hungry as hell and i've like had to be like i can't watch this any longer because this is making yeah. me very hungry are you are you but, watching any other food shows by the way like just in general not, i mean i used to watch kitchen nightmares and mm, um that's not mm, hell, I like know, a food show really that will show. actually make you hungry shout I know, out to I don't everybody watch any yeah yeah <laughs> somebody feed phil i just want to throw a shout out to somebody okay. feed phil which remains um one of the most delightful things on netflix okay but please continue charlotte Yes, I'm going to finish my last thought about Brunch Boys' this account, which is it. But the good thing about it is that, like, I already have, like, seen from their, the, the account, like, all these places I want to go to and it's okay to go places again. Like, I'm mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm saving that, like, that. There was, like, uh, I mean, there was, like, a Mapo Tofu Taco or something. Something uh -huh. like that. That or, sounds like, a, messy and way too spicy to be in a taco. I can't remember what? what exactly it was. Not Maybe not a taco or something. But anyway, mm -hmm. it was just, like, a, an interesting fusion of food. And I just, like, oh, I'm going there next time. So just for the discovery by proxy, I think is a is that's a fun account to follow. <laughs> so, hey, with these three recommendations, I'm just, like, I'm with the times. Hey. Um, <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoy relaxing to those, but definitely send me like any other suggestions. I'm here for all the cute baby and food content. Okay. Good. Let's hit that outro. I got it. Go and that's it for our episode this week, everyone. Thank you as always for listening. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Davindra online at... 
at Devendra on Twitter and at the slash filmcast at slash film.com. Check out our recent episodes and uh, hey, we started our Patreon. So that's uh, that's a fun thing. We're producing more and I'm really enjoying it. If you have wholesome, fun, very not R-rated uh, Instagram <laughs> stories or reels or TikTok accounts I should follow, send them to me <laughs> at Sherlyn Lowe on Twitter. I occasionally fleet. Email us at podcast.engadget.com. Leave us a review on iTunes, please. And subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Uh, we will be here next week because we're taking a break for Thanksgiving. So join us the week after for the next episode. Oh, actually, oh, yeah, actually, actually, yeah. Oh, actually, let's, let's yeah, we have actually, a shout out. Sorry. I can okay, do that again. Do yeah. you want to do no, that? No, let, yeah. me, let, me, let me do that. Yeah, yeah just that last bit. about the Astros Playroom thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And just a quick thing, we're not going to have a normal episode next week because, hey, it's Thanksgiving. But I did record an interview with uh, the director of Astro's Playroom, the awesome PS5 launch title. So keep an eye out for that. We had a really good conversation about Sony's new DualSense controller and kind of how they basically built the game around the design of that controller. So that'll be a fun combo. Check it out next week. And then come back the week after for the next episode. Yeah, I'll cut that together yeah. so it makes a bit more sense. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> uh, all right, we can do right. some Q&A. Okay, yeah. So, chat, if you have anything that you want to ask us, we're fully paying attention to the chat right now. We're done with all of the audio. Let's pay attention. Things. I'm just going to grab a drink real quick. But yeah, you guys sure. Keep talking. I'm, here. I'm here for the questions. Uh, let me just plug in really quickly, but then um, I'll be looking at People are the chat. mainly talking about how good Zell is. Oh, Zell is great. Into it. <laughs> um, and how <laughs> scary it would be because like i mean google already knows everything about us and so mm -hmm. like, why would we let them into our financial transactions like that's always yeah crazy. i know yeah. i mean if you've ever used google pay you're kind of already like well i already do that so i mean you know i think for me i used to be very concerned with things like oh i don't want maps logging my every move right because right. you could turn it on and maps would be like here are your frequent places but it was put to me one time that like someone else liked it because of the convenience. And really it is up to you how much you're willing to give up for slightly easier time with some things. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it I'm, would probably be a good idea if you had like a small business or something, maybe a growing business and uh, you had- From Google a, Pay, you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. you had a, like oh, a Google absolutely, account yeah. specifically like- your business account was an at Gmail account and you can link all of that stuff together so you could do um, business expenses really, really easily, have completely searchable business expenses. Mm. I would keep that separate from my personal stuff, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, ju I just don't know how much to trust this stuff. And by the way, I'm surprised people are saying they love Zelle just because my a lot of my experiences using Zelle is just like trying to send money to people at other banks. That's the main use of it. And the yeah. other person has to be registered properly. They have to do yeah, like annoying. all sorts of things. Like it's it's hard for people who aren't super tech savvy, but hey, when it works, it's super nice. Yeah. The the that I mean, that's the draw, right, of Google because like most people already have Gmail. You know what I mean? Like a lot of mm -hmm. people have a form of Google account. So like it's pretty easy to get them to like just pull into that system. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm, all my friends are on uh, Venmo because, yeah. uh, like, we all like graduated, you know, started like getting our lives set up around the time of the Lucas likes magic Venmo like subway ads in New York City. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the very, um, what's the right word? Um, I, I guess enigmatic. Like mm. what? Yeah. Is, what? What is this? It's just like what is this? It's actually just a picture of one of their developers. Lucas mm -hmm. was just one of the developers at Venmo, and it's like, <laughs> oh, Lucas will you know like pay for drinks this time or something, and uh, yeah, so we all downloaded it, and that's uh, how we look after each other now. Um, there are way too many people <laughs> who do drug transactions on Venmo. Just saying. Mm, yeah um well yeah either they're they're fake or not but anyway uh there's some good <laughs> questions in the chat i didn't want to i didn't want to yes. interrupt no, but uh, let's, let's talk about like macbook air uh yeah there's quite stuff. good macbook air questions uh can do you mind if i just shout out one real quick uh yeah, sure. walt melvin asks if the macbook air m1 base model is enough for lightroom cc uh I, I would say that, like, wait for the Photoshop Native Edition to come out, right? Like, yeah, it's coming yeah. out this year. It's coming out very soon. I think soon, there were so. benchmarks already, though, and, like, mm -hmm. 
It depends on how much, right? Is it your primary machine? I would not trust the air as your primary Photoshop or Lightroom <laughs> machine. But if you have a good desktop at home, if you have like a whole setup and you just want this to be your mobile rig or something, fine. That's perfectly serviceable. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen some people who have said, like, I've run um, the x86 version of uh, uh, Photoshop or something, mm -hmm. and they get a comparable experience. Yeah. Maybe even slightly, slightly better, but, like, such a hair's width that it's very hard to tell. Um, but, yeah, like, so much of the conventional wisdom right now is don't do anything to your primary work machine. Don't make any of these things your primary work machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I saw one reviewer say, like, I, they don't even have Big Sur on their primary work machine. You know, they'll let all of Take your time. Take your time with all these down. things, yeah. Um, yeah, and so then mm -hmm. we got some other M1 questions. Um, so... Uh, What's what's going on here? I'm getting a little bit lost. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay. Well, while you while you look for the questions, I want to shout out. I think DJ Jackson was saying that we can do a pod from the Thanksgiving table. Ha! Huh. No, nah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, you can so be thankful us, for an extra interview podcast. Yeah, yeah so yeah, many of us go. are actually doing like Zoom Thanksgiving now because that is the responsible thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Dev, I think Mark wants to clarify if the game, the Star Wars game you mentioned, is Quest or Rift. Sorry, quest, it is right? Quest. It is Quest. Okay. I forget if I said Rift at the beginning of the thing, but we yeah, you said Rift, and I was like, "Oh, not the Quest," and but I, yeah. I figured, yeah. So it's the Quest, okay? It is the Quest? Um, um, and anyway, if you're buying a headset now, you're looking at the Quest too. You're anyway, looking at the Quest so. too, yeah. yeah. Which Pat I'm considering because I really do want to get that app Supernatural. <laughs> it's a really good workout, and also Beat really... Saber. Beat Saber. I mm, okay. So Patrick in the chat says that he feels like the Mac Mini may be the best option of the three Macs running the sure. M1 in just in terms of price thermals and being able to work from home. Yeah, um, yeah. I know some people, like especially when the Mac Mini just came out, they actually just brought their Mac Mini to places. <laughs> of course, you need to know that you have like all of the peripherals that you're going to um, yeah. require. So like a... Um, a monitor and a keyboard and maybe a mouse but mm -hmm. um sure it, this this reminds me of the days when people would like drag their imax to coffee shops in new york which oh was a thing God. that would happen i think people still do that <laughs> people still do that i'm like man you're really you're really stretching the like yeah the welcome <laughs> to this cafe right now that's crazy <laughs> Uh, DJ in the chat says, are you guys stoked for Cyberpunk 2077? Actually, let's pull the curtain back. Julio, how do you feel about tw Cyberpunk 2077? <laughs> yeah, uh, our video okay. producer, Julio, yeah, yeah. He they love you it, guys can't they, hear him on the stream. You guys can't hear him. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, our video producer, Julio, is the most excited for Cyberpunk 2077. Also, mm -hmm. it's all good. Also, yeah. the one responsible for all the dog Easter eggs you're yes, seeing. Yes, if you, yeah. If you have any, um, if you love the dog um, that's been coming up in the last couple of <laughs> episodes, thank Julio for all the dog content. Um, we have a bunch of production documents that we use for like all of this stuff, and Julio has been the one that's like, "Oh, yeah, Cyberpunk's been pushed back." Like, um, <laughs> he, a couple of. Uh, what was it mm -hmm. a couple of months ago or something before uh, cyberpunk got pushed back from um november 19th i mean we might have been talking a little bit about cyberpunk this we week. wouldn't we would not be going so long for no because we would no. want to be playing more cyberpunk yeah not <laughs> quite so long but um, let's uh yeah. by the way but yeah, hope i'm hoping it hits its december target i think it's the next one and Hey, yeah, I right. want to play some cyberpunk before the end of the year, please. The next target is, I think, uh, December 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see whether or not that comes Not too out. far from now. And by the way, <laughs> if, you, if you want your like dose of cyberpunk goodness, I have played a little bit of Watch Dogs Legion. It is, it's not a perfect game, but I think it's a really interesting interpretation of like the Watch Dog universe. <laughs> and I've always liked those games, even though the first one's like super disappointing. Watch Dogs 2 was a lot of fun. This one is on a whole other level. 
So um, since we mm-hmm. didn't really get to it uh, during the actual segment, do you want to uh, address some of the like skeptic stuff about the Apple M1, especially like people who don't really like the idea that they're being a beta tester of a thing? Like I mean, this? hey, I'm the first person to tell you do not buy first gen products. But as we explained in the episode, I this doesn't feel like a first gen product for me because Apple has been building these chips and they've been building these Macs, and they just kind of sandwich two things that they've already done very well and sandwich them together. The only the only like beta testing part is the app compatibility and the way things work in Big Sur. But thankfully, that is software, not hardware. So like issues are easier to fix with software. I am always more concerned about hardware issues because sometimes you just you can't fix anything and then you get to move on to another device down the line. Uh, and I think that we can say that it will get support for at least a few generations. Like, sure. I think that it'll last as uh, I actually just said in the chat a little while ago that I'm coming to you via a 2012 <laughs> MacBook Pro. Like, yes, I know yes. that I have to upgrade my sh- machine. But um, <laughs> do you think this uh, M1 MacBook Air could last anywhere near as long as that? Uh, yeah, like hell yes, five, because seven years. You, you know, the magic thing about the MacBook Air M1 is that it has no moving parts. And the things that break on every computer are the moving parts. So the fans, the spinning hard disks and things like that. Uh, I don't know if you've had to replace anything yet, Ben, but that those are the things that mechanically just break. I think these machines, um, this machine in particular, because it's fanless, it is... Right now, it feels super fast. It feels like it would. I would easily. I could run this machine that's my main machine for most of my work and be fine with it. And you plop in sixteen gigabytes of RAM and you treat it well. Like I could easily see it lasting four to five years. Yeah. Uh, we've got yet another question mm-hmm. um, from someone saying that they're a computer science student. Will the Air M1 be good enough? We did uh, address this question before, so we'll really quickly address it now, Mm -hmm. which is, in general, yes, it should be, and the support should get better within the next year. But if you're looking for something that does really, really well out of the box, then perhaps go to Devendra's favorite Dell XPS. (laughs) Go to the XPS. We'll also talk to your, if you're currently a student, you should talk to your school, talk to your computer science department because they will tell you which equipment you need so buy you know the things we need to do is buy you know buy for the requirements we we need i guess and when i was in college like they recommended certain you know certain ids they recommended certain hardware and things that would be compatible with the software that the course is used so make sure you're staying in touch with all that Yes. Um, one last question, maybe. Bernard asks, do you sure. think they'll release a smaller MacBook Air? Like, just a really, they want a really small yep. portable laptop to replace My, the 11-inch MacBook Air? I don't know about the 11-inch, but they could easily make this machine smaller. I mean, again, look at the XPS 13. Shave off those bezels. Maybe shave off some of the actual bottom uh, bottom portion of it, and you'd still have a very compact machine with the same size screen. So, I am really looking forward to seeing what the redesigns will be because because of the M1 chip, Apple can all of a sudden do a lot more. Like, I hope they keep it fanless. I hope they keep it super thin. Um, but I want to see them innovate a little. Throw in, you know, an LTE or 5G radio. Like, give us more innovation with these things because there's certainly room for it. Maybe we'll um, see touchscreens eventually. I don't well, know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I think actually last week I saw someone in the chat say like, or I don't know, maybe it was another YouTube comment, mm-hmm. but uh, it was basically someone saying like, okay, if you make the MacBook Air basically into a Surface Book, which is yep. say like, make the screen screen mm-hmm. go all the way back around, make it a touch screen, like, okay, yes. For the last couple of episodes, we've been talking about the possibility that yeah. Apple is you know might try to join their, i don't think they're ever um, going to do that yeah yeah and they're pushing no, so they're pushing the ipad pro join yeah, but there's yeah. the ipad pro yep. and there's the macbook air and i don't think they'll ever never the twain shall be become yeah. a surface air pro i don't think so that's too much mechanical stuff because the thing about the surface book is it has a detachable screen so you have to pop out the screen flip it around dock it back put it back in like apple doesn't like too much mechanical stuff i don't know if you guys have noticed they don't like ports. They don't like too many buttons. Like they want sleek 
all in one hardware. And I don't think a convertible really fits into that. But I am interested to see kind of where things go with the iPad Pro and certainly where things go with iOS support within these Macs. Because if you got a super thin MacBook Air with a touchscreen, all of a sudden you don't really need an iPad Pro. Or what if you got an iPad Pro that could essentially run Mac OS? There's nothing stopping them because they'll have a fully optimized OS for the same chip architecture. So that's where my mind is going. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm just surprised at the number of computer science students looking watching us right now. Hey! It's like, holy, there's a lot of you. Like, you too can here. drop out of computer science and still be interested in technology. <laughs> yeah. I hated um, computer science so much, but hey. Oh, I love computer. Are you kidding? I was getting. Yeah. Anyway, I should yeah. not. Yeah. I think I had some Weren't bad you professors. The one who but yeah. said that you, what was the website that you hated because you were in computer club? Oh, it's not a website. VB.net yeah. is a. Is a, is a yeah, she just say Visual Basic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just, Visual was Basic was. Basic. It was okay. .NET back then. I think it's a. Yeah, but anyway. But, yep. um, yeah, so love computer science, but also hate visual visual basic. Oh no, but VB is there's a lot more nobody likes science VB. than VB. Nobody yeah, nobody VB. nobody yeah. in in computer science likes VB. <laughs> it's all good. There's Python's. I mean, I mm -hmm, I was mm -hmm. bred on like HTML and then C plus plus and then like all the stuff that comes with that, like whatever. Well, then you I then could you never look at real get real programming. Hang of Java. Yeah. Huh? Mm. Yeah, I could yeah. I I I would in computer camp let my teammates handle the Java and I would handle the web <laughs> stuff, but <laughs> that's uh, that's a sort of computer yeah, there's science. There's maybe there's an alternate um universe where uh Sherlyn is a front end developer. It, <laughs> that was my past. This is my yeah. now present, I guess. Maybe this my future I go back to that. Prison. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mardell says we need to start an unofficial Engadget Discord and let the chat never stop. Uh, nope. Yeah, because bad. we have to stop soon. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, it, I, I think the big problem is uh, like just with the thing we were talking about with Twitter fleets, it's the issue of um, being able to moderate it. Like, mm -hmm. Right, it's... right. The, the thing about Discord is we got to find good moderators. Yeah, it would be very hard to find good moderators. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's the thing that everyone has a problem with when they're trying to grow a community yeah. around like literally anything that yep. they do. Because it's a problem with want... our website, right? Yeah, yeah. too. Like, yep. You don't yeah. want your. It's a full time um, job to moderate. Yeah, you don't want your uh, place to be, you know, your like community place to be a, a, a bummer, honestly. Just like. For sure. But hey, hit us Something up on Twitter. Sad. I always look at Twitter as like the ongoing conversation. That's why I'm kind of addicted to Twitter and I have to stop myself from doom scrolling too much. But I enjoy Twitter for the conversation. I wish they would launch more conversational features to really make that service more useful. Uh, because I miss the days of like old forum internet, you know, BBS forums, um, oh, even forums man. like, yeah, BBS forums, uh, CGI chat rooms, old web forums. Ooh. I used to live on that stuff. And, you know, I miss that. And Twitter is the best encapsulation of that, like ongoing conversations. That I are, agree. You know, if you guys want to keep the chat going with us, go. if you have a Twitter account, that's great. Uh, a Discord would be nice, but we'd need to find some way to moderate mm -hmm. and police. I know that Florence Ion has her own Discord server. Oh, that's I think cool. she has some good mods on there. Uh, that's cool. So Twitter, yeah, Twitter I mean, is where it's at. Yeah. Twitter is definitely the best way I think to get us. Uh, so we'd love to keep chatting, but I don't think we can. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta go. It's do yeah. the work. Yeah. We have to crank out all that content you crave on engadget.com. So thank you to everybody in the chat. Let's thank you video team. So this stream comes to you via our video team, which is led by Kyle mock with Owen Davidoff, Julio Barrientos, Luke Brooks, and sometimes Jason, shark got it got it i've been calling him justin for the like last proud three. of you justin shank shark. shank yeah. <laughs> Stop. yeah uh it's but again it's powered by everyone in the chat everyone in the chat is the one who makes it fun to do all of these things so sit tight next week we're going to have that interview with the designer and director of astro's playroom and we'll be back live streaming uh the week after next the week after thanksgiving thank you and goodbye everybody goodbye thanks for joining us All right.